All right, so um, I have a copy of last week's work. It's in the network folder, so you can get my work. If yours didn't quite end up how you wanted it, I'm going to give you my work at the end of the day. If you would like to double check your work against mine, it'll be here for you. So uh, in the classroom data folder, in our class folder, Campus Android, I'm going to be putting a copy of the project with the date. Uh, so if you want the complete project from last time, just grab that whole folder, my SDCE 922. I'm going to copy that over to my flash drive, and I'm going to change the date to today, today's date. At the end of the day, I'll put that into the folder as well, and you'll have a copy. Today's the 27th. So I've got a copy on my flash drive. And that's just coming out of the network folder. If you've got a copy of my project, um, you'll see inside the folder we have the desktop website folder and the mobile website. If you're using your own version, uh, you'll want to do this at some point, but I'll come back to this again a little later. Whereas our jQuery mobile project is in a folder called mobile website. And then we would have a desktop, which doesn't have anything just yet. We're not at that point yet. Uh, if you have your own project and it's all of these files, that's all you need for the moment. Later on, we'll separate them into their own folder. So either get a copy of my work or we'll work on yours. And we're going to be working on the uh, index, the JS file, and the CSS files. So if you open all three of them, remember you can select all three of those files, index.html, kodika.js, and kodika.css, select them all, and then right-click, edit with Notepad++. So I'm opening the project files. open our working files inside of Notepad, and then we'll get started in just a moment. All right, so it was a whole five days ago or so, so I'm going to reload my project in the browser just to remind me what it looks like. If you open up your developer's console, remember you can change the view a little bit. Looks a little bit mobile, mobile friendly like to remind you how to do that. I'm in Firefox, but I think the one in Chrome works a little better. I'm in Firefox and I want to hit F12 on the keyboard. That'll probably bring up your console on the bottom of the screen. I want to move it to the right side of the screen, so there's an icon here, dock it to the right. It's the third icon from the X, from the right. So I want to dock that to the right. You can rearrange this divider if you'd want, or you can also hit the uh, fifth icon, responsive to time mode, a little square and a big square. That'll change your view also so that it looks something like that, like a mobile device. And all of this is just, again, a simulation of if you have, re if you, have you know, resized your, your browser. It's close enough there, too. So in any event, I'm just loading up the project again. Home page art screen, all of that, got some content, placeholders. We won't spend a lot of time to fill in all of the content. That's pretty elementary. You know, the idea of filling in the screen with real content, that's something that you could be, that you could do on your own. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time because that's content. I'm a little bit more concerned about the uh, design and such for the moment. Speaking of design, I'm, in my case, I'm seeing that if I scroll up and down a little bit on the art on the computer screen, the footer stays fixed, but not the header. I haven't addressed that, 
but I have addressed footers can be fixed to the bottom of the screen. The footer should be at the bottom, and if I need to scroll, it's nice that my footer is there all the time, always visible. I would like that for my header as well. See how my header goes away if I scroll down and the footer stays there. You may not see that if you've got, for example, a screen here that doesn't let you scroll. It makes sense. There's nothing to scroll, so you don't see it. In my case, when I'm in the computer screen, I do have a little bit of scrolling that I could do, and I noticed that the header's scrolling away. We're going to fix that. I'm also seeing that it's cutting off, in my case, the text of my header up there. That'll be a little bit of CSS changes. Art classes looks fine. Computer classes cut off. Home is fine. The footer is fine on all screens. About screen, we made that pop up. So we've got some content things to add, still with some structural things, the, the sidebars and that sort of thing. So you should have the project loaded up in Notepad, and then we're going to get back to the index file. All right, so before I forget, uh, I'm going to pass out the sign-in sheet. I'm going to start off with one of them. Uh, there's 24 spots, so if you're 25th or further, remember to uh, let me know so I can pass out another one. But make sure you put your hands on this one and uh, sign it and pass it on to your neighbors. <coughs> Thank you. 
right? So our uh, project should be up. Um, before I forget again, the thing is that I want to have the... Um, I want to have that uh, header not scroll away. That's an easy thing to fix. So we had down on our footers, let's see, article footer. On the footers, we had data position equals fixed to keep the footer at the bottom at all times. We'll need the exact same thing then for the headers. So I'm just going to select this to save myself a little bit of typing. Uh, select the part about data position fixed. We're going to copy and paste that into any of the headers that we want to stay fixed, which is most likely all of them, which is at the moment um, three or four maybe. So up on the line 50 or line 16, header, data roll, header, I need there at the end, data position fixed. We're going to add that to the. We're going to add that to the different. Uh, to the different wherever you've got a header. So just take a moment to browse your code wherever you've got a header. Add data position fixed to it. So in my case, that would be line 16, and then I see another header on line 70. So I'm just going to paste the same information. Data position fixed. I want to keep that header at the top at all times. Then I've got another section, that's the art section, computer section. This is in line 144, so I need that there as well. the moment then at about line 237 we've got COM 101 section 102 and such and they don't have a lot of content but perhaps in the future they will have content where I will be required to scroll and if I scroll that header will scroll away because we never fixed it so I would recommend then on line 238 there's a header there to fix 249 fix that header and 260 fix that header as well once we've set up this basic structure, then we can reuse it. Uh, so on my COM 101, I add data position at the end there. On the next section, same thing for the COM 102. 201. And 301. On the About section, that one's not necessary. We do have a header there. That one behaves differently, doesn't it? That's a dialog box. It's not behaving like a page that or screen that takes up the whole viewport. It exists as a floating element, and in that case, it doesn't need the data position fixed. I don't think anything bad will happen if we add it. So data position fixed to that pop-up, but... I don't think anything will happen. I'll, I'll check it, but I'm not going to leave it there. Let's see, refresh my code. So I don't see a difference on home and art, but on computers, this should be the difference. You see that? I'm scrolling my content, but my footer and my header stay fixed. They stay visible. That's the point of adding position fixed. As for the About button, 
again, it doesn't doesn't even matter because it's a pop-up. It doesn't behave the same, so I won't. I will not add data position fixed to the uh, about section. It doesn't need it. It doesn't behave the same. Over on the art section, if you recall from our example project, we have a couple of buttons there that open up more content. One is a side panel, and the other is an external link. So let's go over to our art section, and we're going to add a side panel. So that means over starting at about uh, line 69. That's where my uh, art page, art screen starts. Um, we have, or we hopefully have, at the end of that content, line 120 or so, we have a grid, that transparent grid that we use to divide up our screen. Uh, I'm going to place a button uh, we're going to put two buttons eventually in UI block A and block B of the first row. So this will be um, calendar. That'll be a link that um, opens up a side panel. So we've seen how to do links before with jQuery Mobile. We have the a tag, href to something. Just put the pound sign there as a temporary placeholder. I want that to have a data role of button so that it looks like a button. Well, I am going to be zooming in and out like I usually do. Um, data role button and um, we're going to have maybe a nice little icon, data-icon. We have an icon for a calendar. It might be good for the moment. Then I'll save it and uh, check it in the browser. It's a plain old link, but we've elevated it with the data role of button, data icon calendar. Let's check that. If I go over to art, I have a calendar button. doesn't go anywhere yet, but I'm not done with the code yet. We've seen this before. It's just a button. Now, where it's going to go will be more content within our within our project but it's not so much content that it requires its own section section is for a whole screen full of content this is going to be a sidebar that relates to the current content so we've used article for the main content of our sections but we have another HTML5 tag that will allow us to add um, extern um, extraneous or ancillary content to a section, which is known as aside, A-S-I-D-E, aside. This is aside content. And the jQuery mobile specification recommends to add side panel content, like asides, as the first item within a section. So we're actually going to back up before header, so at about line 70. Create a new line there. And this will be our aside tag, which has a pair. This is content that is separate from the main content, it's side content, uh, but it's still part of this section of art content. 
this needs a uh, data role to give it the definition of what this is, because aside all by itself, conceptually it's separate content, but visually doesn't look like anything special. With data role panel, now it's going to behave like a side panel. And then I can start adding some content in here. Um, oh, one more thing. ID. In order for us to link to it, call this art cow. In order for us to link to it, to, to have that button go and display this content, well, it needs a unique identifier, art cow. And um, just for the moment, what I'll do is add very briefly some text here, art calendar. We'll fill in some more of the details in a moment. We've got an uh, we've got an aside. It's got a data role. It's got an ID. We need to add that ID to the button so that when we click the button, it goes to the panel, and then we can test it. So I'll go back to where my button was. Art Cal. Pound Art Cal. Because it's an ID. And we don't have very much in the calendar at the moment, but I want to set it up. Save it and run it to see your result. here, so I will go to my browser, click the button, our calendar. You see how the content slides over, and that should reveal extra content. It's all part of this art section, but it's its own independent content, and therefore it's in the aside. This element has uh, a couple more attributes. For example, the, the, the display, the method of display. Right now, we didn't, we didn't specify a method. So do you see how it animated into, into view? We have two more animations specifically for this element. And we can add them here in the uh, attribute. So before the, uh, before the ID, because as I said, I recommend the ID in class be last, we have a data-display. We've got three possibilities, the default that, we, that we're looking at, and another one called overlay. Save and run that and compare. We've got the default one, which I forget what it's called. We'll look it up in a moment. And then this one, overlay. We've got a third one, which I also forget, but we'll, we'll look it up. Go ahead and save and run that, and you'll see that the animation for the panel appearing then should be a little different. Okay, so this one is the default right here. You see how all the content sort of slides over to make way for what's below it. And that's one we just did right now. Will overlay on top of your content. Your original content is already there, and then this overlays on top of it. I'm sort of looking at it in tablet size. If I was looking at it a bit more like in, you know, mobile phone version, which is a little taller and thinner, and I overlay, notice it overlays. It knows how far to go. And notice I can click outside of the element to, to close it. If this was on a mobile device, this would be very cool because I would actually be able to slide it back and forth using slide motion that I'm used to in apps. The same thing with the original default that slides over and I can tap outside of it to bring it back or I'll be able to slide it back with a slide motion. I'm going to take a quick detour to look up the other the, uh, the, the other possibilities of that. It's panel or side panel, slider, panel, panel.
panel widget. Panel. Oh, yeah, this one's it. Okay, so we've got overlay. This is the one that we just did. We've got reveal, which is the default. Yeah, we've no, we've got push. Push is the default. See, there's a slight difference between reveal and push. See, with push, that other content, it's like waiting outside of the screen and it pushes into the screen. See that? It's like invisible over here and it pushes in. As for reveal, it's like it's under the content and then the top content slides away. So we, have, we can do overlay, we can do reveal and push one of those three. Anyone that you like, overlay, reveal, push. I like overlay. That's the one I'll keep. But if you like a different one, you can do that one. And it comes over here. Now, I also want to build in a little bit of redundancy here. This is an example of the good user experience. Uh, you may be a totally savvy person and know that you'll be able to swipe it out of the way and all of that. But there's going to be other people that might get a little confused. This thing suddenly took over my screen. How do I, how do I get it out of the way? Well, to have a little obvious close button would be nice. I can figure out perhaps that I can tap outside and it goes away. Not everyone might. So with a simple close button to tap it, it should close it to go back. So we'll, we'll add in a way for people, an obvious way for people to close. Um, before that first heading inside of the aside, uh, we'll make this a link. An active link, so the A tags. What's that? It may, but it is uh, different devices handle the back in a different way. So who knows if that back will close it or take you back to the home screen. So it'd be better to create a behavior that we know should work than instead of guessing what might work. So um, this is going to be a plain old icon eventually, but we will just call this close. We're going to hide that text. We want a little anchor text. And this will um, href pound art. We're in the art screen. Click this button to close the side panel to go back to the art screen. To make it behave like a button, we have the data roll. button, data roll of button. We also have a data rel in this case of close. The relationship or the reason for this button is that it's supposed to close the current element. So sometimes we have data rels, sometimes we have data rolls. We saw data rel briefly with the dialog box last time mostly dealing with data roles. Sometimes there's relevance. This should close the panel. I'm going to add an icon. Data icon to caret dash L. This will make a little uh, sort of angle bracket an arrow that will kind of show that this can close. And I don't want it to show that text, I just want it to show an icon. We saw in the documentation we can do data-icon POS, icon position. And the funny thing is we're not really dealing with the position of the icon, we want to get rid of the text, so we have a property called, or uh, a value, of this attribute called no text. 
make it behave like a button, but don't use the text, just use the icon. So data icon position, no text. Check that in your browser, save it and run it. The result should be the overlay overlays, and then we have a button there. Maybe it's not exactly where I wanted it to be. We can fix that, of course. We've got a button where you click that and it goes away. Maybe that's not the icon. Maybe you think a close icon might work better. So we have these possibilities. Let's give this a try. Instead of caret L, we can do one called delete. This creates a little X. That might make more sense as the close button for this element. It's up to you, but I'm going to go with perhaps delete. The the purpose of this panel is to display information about events related to art classes. And for the moment, we cannot make this dynamic in that it updates itself to the latest information. We don't have that knowledge yet. We'll just add some static content that maybe has a couple of items that say what's happening this month and next month and so forth. So some, we'll just add some plain static content. This aside can include it just about anything like pictures and paragraphs and text and all of that. So what I want to do is we will say that we've got a uh, heading 2 and we're gonna say here's what you missed last month, here's what's this month, and here's what's next month. Last month was um, August. We've got um, this month, which is uh, September, and next month, October. I'm using all the same level of heading because they are all conceptually equal. They're all a month. If I was talking about the first week of August, I may use that in H3 and place it below H2 because then that H3 has a meaning related to that H2. Talking about the fourth week of September, that would be an H3 because it's a subheading of heading 2. And what, we'll, and what I'll display in those months is a simple bullet point list, unordered list. which require list items. Just put two, maybe. Same thing, September and October. What I put into it doesn't matter too much, so you can make up some cool events for those art classes. I'll put some in in a moment. We're just putting content into, this, into the side panel. I can have a lot of content because I can have the side panel scroll independently of the main content of um, the article. But let's say in August we had um, student art show. Water color expo this month <coughs> faculty art show let's say in September just one thing and the next month we've got three things coming up um, painting gala 
And uh, digital <laughs> art showcase. Just content. I could add pictures. I could even add some of these other widgets, like collapsible elements or um, list view elements. It's just that I am more confined in the side panel. I shouldn't have very complex content there. This is content that I'll view briefly and then slide it off to the side. And so if I open that up, I've got some side content. You may notice that the heading twos font size of the heading 2 is actually larger than the font size of the heading 1. jQuery Mobile decided that when you're using an aside and you're using heading 1, 2, whatever, that these might be good sizes. And in this case, heading 1 is smaller than heading 2. And we've always seen heading 1s are larger than heading 2s. Well, if we want to override that, that's where CSS comes in. Let's explore that a bit. Let's say I don't like the default of jQuery Mobile at all, so we can write our own custom CSS code to override it. Before that, let's just confirm everyone is on the right page here. Did everyone manage to create this side panel? Put some content. So if we want to change any of the default behavior, like maybe moving that button to the right side instead of to the top left, looks a little odd there maybe and maybe changing the sizes of these fonts. You know, maybe I want to center the word art calendar and then make the, the months a little smaller, different font size or something. That's where CSS comes in. If you recall our project at the very top, first we have a jQuery mobile CSS file which sets all of our basic styles. And then we have our Kodika, which can be named anything, but that's what came out of Kodika.com. We have our external CSS file, our own custom code of CSS. So you should have opened also the Kodika CSS file. Put your custom CSS here. Okay. We're going to reach back to when we were talking about CSS. We have, remember, uh, CSS selectors. We need to write some rule to select an element in the HTML to affect it. So a selector is used to affect something or control something of HTML. And I want to change the size of H1. I think it's a little small. And the size of H2, I think it's too big. So logically, perhaps, we may start to write the H1 tag that we're going to change its font size. So curl the brackets on that. Font size. For the moment, we um, just go with me on this for the moment. 1 EM. I'll explain that unit in a moment. Before I go too much further, am I on the right track? <clears throat> I'm trying to affect the size of those headings inside the sidebar, and according to my HTML, I've used heading 1 here, so I'm on the right track, right? This is a much too generic plan of attack. This selector is selecting too much. This is going to change or try to change every heading 1 all over my project, not just the sidebar. Wherever I've used heading 1, and I've used heading 1 in the header blocks, and I've used heading 1 on every of my screens. So if I try to change the font size here, it might affect it everywhere. Perhaps to be a little bit more specific, I could use a class or an ID that might work, but here's another way. If we write aside space h1, 
we've touched on this a little bit when we talked about CSS. And that basically here what I'm saying is any heading ones that are inside of a sides should be affected like this. So notice the syntax. We're not putting the angle brackets. We're just putting this, the HTML tag without the angle brackets. And we're saying heading ones inside of a sides. There is a space here. Don't put it together because then you have something that doesn't exist, a side h1. That's, that does, that's not real. A side space h1. Just out of curiosity, what I also like to do is put in a quick background color. I'm not going to keep this, but I like to put a background color just to show that I'm affecting what I think I'm trying to. CSS, since it's the next higher level of difficulty, we sometimes go, off, go astray and don't figure out what are we trying to do. Because of the box model, every HTML element is a box, but the box is invisible. And so when I'm trying to figure out padding and margin and sizes and such, why is this bumping up against this? I can't figure out why does my CSS look weird. Because we've got an invisible box. I personally like to add a background color of whatever random color, and red is quick to type, if you can know the keyboard. Red is quick to type, which will then make a red box. So I can see that invisible box that I'm trying to affect. I'm going to save that and refresh. Hopefully then you see that only the heading one in the calendar has been changed. These up here should not change because these are also heading ones, but they're not in the aside, so they shouldn't change. I put a red background just to see the extent of it all, so I'm just kind of also seeing there's this empty space here. If that's too much space, this element is not to blame, perhaps. It only goes that far. Maybe this element has other properties that make up all of that space. But anyway, here, um, I seem to be targeting the thing that I am trying to target. Maybe comment out that background color. And the issue at hand is the size. Uh, I don't believe we've talked about uh, setting font sizes in CSS yet. Uh, you have the selector, then you have the property and the value. The property that I'm affecting is font-size. And traditionally you have, for example, 12 point, 12 point size, PT. Well, points are a unit of measurement that is not uh, often used in websites or mobile projects. Points are used most often in print. If I'm over in Microsoft Word, I'm going to choose a 12-point font or 14-point or 20-point because eventually something is going to get printed out on physical paper that is always 8.5 by 11 inches. So 12 points is 12 points is 12 points, because it's always on the same physical thing. But when we deal with mobile devices, here's a 5-inch screen, and 12 points might be too small. But on a 4-inch screen, 12 points might be just right. And on a tablet, 12 points is tiny. So we should use relative measurements instead of absolute measurements. I'm going to make a little note here. PT which is points, are absolute measurements, which we should avoid. As, as often as we can, we should try to avoid the absolute measurements. Instead, use relative measurements. percentage or uh, M or 
n. I think there's a couple of other ones. So if we had, for example, font size of 100%, that makes sense in that it is the default font size 100%. To think about it easily, 12 points, basic font size, 100%. If we then wanted something twice as big as the default, what might that be? 200, twice as big. So 200% is twice as big. <laughs> Our calendar looks uh, commanding in that spot. So percentages are often a good value to use. They are relative. If I'm on a smaller device, it won't be so big that it takes over the screen. It's just going to be 200% larger than what the screen can, can handle. And the other measurements that I had here were M and N. These are also relative, but they work more like this. If I were to write 1M, that is one basic unit of M, and M is based on whatever particular font we're dealing with, the size of its letter M. So a font often has a very thin letter I. It takes up very little space. It's just a tall bar. An M is, you know, three times bigger than an I, you know, the shape-wise of it. So here's a relative measurement. Based on the font, its letter M, this is one unit. So the result looks small again. So if I wanted then two times larger than the original font size, then I would put a 2. So it's sort of like 100%, it's a 1. It's sort of like 200%, it's a 2. If I wanted to do a font that was 3 and 3 quarters larger than the default in percentages, what's 3 and 3 quarters percent larger? 375 percent. Sorry, if we were dealing with percent. But yes, if we were dealing with M, 3.75 M. So we are able to do fractions. Yes? I was wondering why the multiplication ones were the normal signs, but they could choose their default ways now. Sorry, say that one more time. I was wondering why the defaults were H1 and H2 the same. The jQuery mobile team decided that H1s inside of an aside should look like this, and the H2 should look like that, which I don't like, don't agree, but we can easily change it. So for some reason, th they chose those sizes. So different settings have different defaults. Yes, um, we've seen that before in other times when we have used the heading 1. Usually heading 1 is the biggest size, and then heading 2 is second biggest, and third, H3 is third biggest. But they sort of reversed it in the aside. Yeah. So here, if I do 3.75, that's 375%, basically. That's going to be a really big text. Too big. So whatever you want to choose here, percentages or M's. Let's say I want to do, um, well, let's see what 2M looks like. 2M might work. It's 200%, so to speak. I could then decide to change the size of these H2s if I wanted. Same sort of way. Yes? And what does N mean? Oh, N is related again to the font, but now it's based on the size of the letter N. So the M is the letter M, like Mary, and N is N, like Nancy. So depending on the font, an N is a little bit this, almost the size of the M. And so it's just a relative measurement depending on the font. Why don't the M double? Your N doesn't change at all? Yeah, it seems to go back to the normal one. But uh, if you put the exact same value, So, well, we've got percentages and M's, which are much more common for whatever reason. Um, 
Maybe, what about over on Chrome? Maybe Firefox doesn't like ends. Chrome. That's right, Chrome. Okay, um, console doesn't say anything. Well, I wouldn't worry about it because we're going to get everything that we need from percentages or M's. But the theory is that N is supposed to be the size of the letter N of the font. Um, we can get what we want out of M's or percent. So what we can do is, uh, I'm not going to use that background color. It was just there for me to see what that was. And maybe I could do text dash align center if I wanted to keep that text centered within the aside. I don't quite like that. It, I think it looks okay on the left if you like that on the center. Well, it's a simple text align center property. Okay, so let's say we wanted to do something about the um, that button. The default is that it has it on, has it on the left side, uh, but we can also control it via CSS. Um, let's see what we've got. Uh, this is our close button in the HTML. We can we should always be able to figure out, or we should always be able to write some form of CSS either with classes, IDs, tags, or some combination of it. You saw here that with heading 1, which is inside of an aside, we were able to target only the art calendar text. So perhaps if I write aside A, that might target that element, because I'm trying to affect that inside of the aside. Let's give that a shot. If that doesn't work, we also have the ability to use classes or IDs. Most likely classes, uh, because we may want this button to be, um, the, the look of that button to be reused more than once. And that's when a class shines, because you can reuse it. So I'm, I haven't tested this yet, so we'll see how it goes. We'll do aside A, aside space A, just to make sure we're targeting what we think we're targeting. I'll put a background color. This is not affecting the position of it just yet, but again, because this can be a tricky puzzle piece, I often like to see the box that I'm trying to affect. Let's see if this code targets what I want. A side space A. So I didn't get any red background color. 
which may or may not be a sign that it is working. Um, let me do one more thing here. Because if we're trying to target A tags inside of the aside, uh, don't wouldn't we also perhaps use A tags for other reasons? Hmm. See what I'm getting at? The puzzle piece of CSS. I think I'm doing one thing and something else might happen. I have an A tag that I'm trying to affect, which is a button. So I wrote some code for it. But now it's too generic. I use that A tag perhaps to make a link on something else, and now that has been affected, which I wasn't trying to affect. So this is, is going to be a uh, preview about how this will happen a lot. When you start, especially with a framework, jQuery Mobile is already all set up, and we can, of course, edit it. But we're going to step on our toes a lot of times because this piece has been designed like this, which we're trying to change, which is connected to this other piece. And I'm not blaming jQuery Mobile. They're all like this. If you're going to use Sencha, Ionic, jQuery Mobile, on and on and on, all of these frameworks that help you to create a design quickly, they're all like this. They're all interrelated, and then sometimes it's more difficult than others to write our own custom code to override defaults. The way to make sure that none of this code conflicts is for you to write the whole framework from scratch. You yourself will write all of your code to make these buttons appear how you want them to and position them and the rollovers and the fonts and all of that. Well, that's what was done for us inside of the CSS file. This 200 kilobytes of design. So again, I'm not blaming jQuery Mobile. They're all like this. So our tactic here then may be too broad. Uh, in this case, I think it might be easiest to use classes. Mm, you could use data role, but that'd be button, which is generic. So let's add a class to this close button. That will make sense because I might use that close button other times throughout my project. And I want to put it on the right side like I am thinking about here. So class or ID as the last attribute. Um, call this btn panel close. BTN panel close. Our code can be a number of uh, <coughs> written in a number of ways. One possibility is to simply do uh, dot panel close, which targets any element with a class of panel close wherever it exists throughout our whole project. And just to confirm, we can further target it. Well, this is a class in an aside
I'm trying to remember how I did this before, so I'm dusting off the cobwebs. So you see here, live, that this is um, sometimes a little trickier than it might seem. We have an element with a unique class in a particular other element, and it may be that there are other factors in play. So what I'm going to do briefly is open up my element inspector here. on the right side like that. I'll show you what this uh, what I'm doing here in, in a little while later but we want So it's on a different, completely different kind of track, it seems. Try this code instead. Uh, aside space dot UI dash BTN, there is a built in jQuery mobile class already in play, it seems. And even though my background color is not really showing up because my element is so small, the trick is I want that element to float to the right of that line. That's, that's the idea that I want that close button more to the right. Um, so give that a try and see if that floats your little button to the right side, which might make sense to have it there instead of the left. This is somewhat optional, but just to show you this, try that. Yeah. Uh, It's not there. It's not visible. It's built into. Um, it's basically, you know, our data role. That's a shorthand, and when we unpack that, when the web browser unpacks that internally, somewhere there, there is a UI BTN. I'm seeing that in the web browser, and I'm not going to quite get to this yet, but this is what UI button is ultimately doing. UI link, UI button, UI icon delete, UI button icon text, etc. So the shorthand is really all of this longhand, which we don't have to deal with ourselves. And that's why this is didn't you know quite do it right away, because there's pieces that are conflicting, so to speak, the cascade in the CSS. Possibly, it may be because uh, that particular element is that icon and it's not large enough. Um, let's see what happens if I take out the no text part. And that, so there's probably other factors in play in you know, some of these other elements over here uh, or over here that are overriding what I'm trying to do. So in any event, this, this will be fine for the moment, and we don't need a background color. I was just trying to put something there to see. But the point of what I'm trying to do is trying to make that button float to the right. That code seems to be fine, so that's what we'll do. Uh, maybe give ourselves a note here. The jQuery mobile class dot UIBTN is used 
to target the button. If I only had .uibtn, we've got buttons all over our project. So again, I've got a side which is to focus on a button that is in an aside. That's the point of that. Let's do our first break, and I'll put up my code here if anyone needs some help. Um, it's 712, we'll be, take a break until 722, and we'll go on.